from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snow White. Thank you for downloading the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. This is Series 1, Episode 105. This is the talk I gave recently at the National Capital Chapter of Trout Unlimited. We met up at a bar in Bethesda, Maryland, and I gave my introduction or 101 talk on what I think people that live around here need to know to get into fly fishing for steelhead on the Great Lakes. I know I don't live on the Great Lakes. I don't fish them regularly. I do maybe one to two trips a year, but this is my consolidated list of what I think a novice Great Lakes steelhead angler should know. The podcast is brought to you by Speedwell Law. Are you a landowner with cold water on your property? Have you ever thought about donating your land for conservation purposes? Misha Gill with Speedwell Law will assist you in drawing up plans to conserve your land. Misha will donate the time if you donate the land. Find him at speedwelllaw.com, S-P-E-E-D-W-E-L-L-L-A-W.com. So this is basically just going to be an introduction to Steelhead Alley, what you need, uh, where to fish, what to bring, just like a rough introduction. I didn't want to make this a long, big talky talk presentation, so it's a brief introduction on Steelhead Alley, Steelhead. All right, so brief introduction. That was a good year. Last year wasn't. All right, next slide. So what I'm gonna cover today, what is a Steelhead? Where are they? When are they? What gear is needed? How to catch them, flies, and resources, some of which resources that we didn't mention tonight. Go to the next one. So what is a Steelhead? It's just a larger form of a rainbow trout. They're migratory. These fish evolved on the west coast in volcanic rivers that, from what I understand, are a little nutrient poor compared to what a river out here would be. So these fish don't have the means of getting large and feeding and becoming a large organism to be able to survive and reproduce in those waters. So they learn to adapt and swim out to the ocean take advantage of the bounty of nutrients and protein out there, which made them large enough that they could then return to reproduce and have their young survive in those waterways, mature after smolting, and then leaving back to the ocean to redo it. Now, in the Pacific Northwest, you would have iteroporous fish. Fish that are going to go multiple reproductive cycles between fresh and salt water. Unlike salmon, these don't die. They're like the shad we have here on the Potomac. <clears throat> the ones in the Great Lakes, they were stocked in the 50s, 60s, still throughout today, and they still migrate. They just don't know that Lake Erie, Ontario, Huron, the Champlain, those are not salt water. So they're still doing the same migratory route, but not knowing where they are. It's like you could put a striped bass from the Chesapeake Bay in an impoundment in Nebraska. It has no idea it's not in its native waterways. And we take advantage of that. You can absolutely go out and fish for these from boats, but we wait as fly anglers until they come into shore. We can either fish for them at the mouth of the streams, or we can fish for them up in the tributaries. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so these fish don't know they're not in the Pacific Ocean. So the one thing they don't have to do is worry about the osmotic regulation of travel between fresh and salt water. They can stage, which they're doing right now at the mouths of the river, swim right up. Don't have to worry about getting their cells all mixed up and having to change their metabolism and cell structure. And it is not West Coast fly fishing. Great Lake steelheading. Completely different. I've never done it out west. I plan to, but it's evolved more into nymphing, smaller streamers, and the new method now, of course, is swinging some big intruder-style flies on two-handed rods. And this one, you can see, 
that was the first year in that picture I went out with two-handed rods. And I've never felt, I should say not two-handed rods, that was the first year I went out with detruder style flies. I've never felt a more aggressive tug from a steelhead than on those couple of days. All right, next one. So maps, you can go just Google steelhead alley and find maps. This one just popped up. This is all the streams in Ohio. It's got a couple of, uh, so there's Ashtabula, Conneaut. So there's Pennsylvania. And you can see these are the major tributaries. And you're going to have them on all up in here. This is from the Ohio DNR website. And it gives you the fishing spots and pullouts and parking spots of all the spots you can fish. Now I've been told that just because they're stocked in a specific stream doesn't mean they're going to go back up that stream. These fish basically will just go up any tributary they find suitable. So you can go to these non-popular streams like Elk and Walk, Walnut, Conneaut, and find the little streams doing just some blue line research on your phone and probably get into some steelhead. Fish migrate, that's what they do. I was telling people earlier, three bone fish were netted around Manhattan this week in commercial nets. That tells you. Bone fish? Three bone fish were netted up in Manhattan. So once you find your place, you're going to go. It's time to start researching everything you need to know about that river. And the two rivers I've put most of my time into are the Chagrin up near Cleveland and the Salmon River in New York. Two completely different streams, different Great Lakes, different organisms that live in there. One's a tailwater, one's a freestone. So I know I can go fish the salmon in New York and have a tailwater which has regulated water temperatures and I can go up even after a snow melt day and still find clear water. Every time I go to the Chagrin River, a week before, there's a massive thunderstorm and it melts 10 inches of snow. And the river's completely blown out. That's just my fishing luck. All right, next map, pictures, what do we have? All right, so where are they? You've got to find the holding water. Any Great Lakes trip should have steelhead between now and early May. You want to find the right water speed, depth, temperature, and substrate. Where do these fish that are trout want to hold where they can spend the least amount of energy while gaining nutrients? So net gain. Where can these fish hold in water? And as the water gets colder, the metabolism slows down exceptionally. So what I like for is kind of riffly water like this with some big rocks in between, maybe a drop off. And I want somewhere... See, these guys are standing in the middle of the river. You see that way too often, especially with center pinners. So I like more of the edges, and I want boulders to gravel to dinner plate sized rocks with uh, fast enough water that I can swing or nymph, but my flies won't get held up. But I also don't want it too fast that when I throw my fly in, it just gets sucked down. The other things I look for in good steelhead water aren't so much the fishy. It's more about me. I need a safe place where I can wade. The Salmon River being a tailwater is exceptionally slick. So I need a safe place where I'm not going to fall and break a limb. I've tripped on salmon and fallen and punctured holes in my hands. I've fallen from slippy rocks, from people's fly lines going over me and I'm having to duck. I'm also looking for somewhere that I can net a fish or get it up into shallow water. In most of these spots, I'm camped out. If I find the right water, I'm camped there all day. So I'm going to set up a camping stove, I'm going to set up a thermos of coffee, my bags, my gear. Somewhere that I've got maybe a little bit of beach in the shade with a nice seat on a rock. And I also want to have no overhanging trees. If I've got a switch rod and I'm holding a fish, I want to be able to back up as far as I can, not in overhanging branches. I'm not going to wade too deep, because most of the time this is really awful weather. Especially last March, I was fishing in 10 to 15 degree Fahrenheit air by myself. If I slipped and went under, not that long until hypothermia kicks in. So luckily I'm fishing in some urban areas, and you should always carry a whistle anyway. If you blow a whistle on the Salmon River, the landowners that live along the river will come out. They know what that means. All right, next slide. So when are they? They're going to return to those trips in fall. They might not all come in at the same time. If every fish migrated at the same time, and there was a catastrophic environmental effect, all the fish would die at once. So the salmon come in in waves, the steelhead come in when they're ready. So right now you've got 
The king salmon are coming in right now. And these fish are big. And the females have got a couple pounds of eggs in them. That's one of the main reasons these fish are migrating now, is that it's a free smorgasbord of just protein. It's going to be water temperature. You know, they're not going to be able to breathe and maintain a nice equilibrium in their metabolism if it's too hot. Hot water pushes out oxygen. So colder water is going to be a little bit more egregious, or uh, it's going to be a little bit more of what they like. They're, they're trapped, they're cold water fish. And they're going to hold over as they come in. They're coming in October, November, December. Some might go back out, some might come back in. But the majority is going to be an overwinter fishery. So I have later on that you need to be prepared for the worst weather possible because it's the Great Lakes. And I have here River Boss. If you're going up to the Erie Tribs, make sure you write that website down. It's also great for the Potomac. That's what I use to update the Orbis website for the Potomac here every week. Temperatures, levels, clarity. Uh, it tells you what the ideal river levels are. If you talk to the fly shops and say, hey, I'm going up to a certain body of water, what's ideal flow, they'll tell you. So you know to better plan your trip around that. And then, like I said, you've got difference between freestones and tailwaters. Elk, and Walnut, Pennsylvania, they're going to freeze over. You might have what's called shelf ice, which just goes, or anchor ice, from the stream bottom to the top. And that's going to push fish out of the water or concentrate them based on whether they're getting cut off or not. It's also not easy to wade, and if you've got a chunk of ice that's 20 feet across and 10 inches thick floating down and hits you, it's gonna knock you over. I've seen videos of people being funny, getting on top of these ice flows and fishing for a little Instagram video. That's Darwin Awards right there. If you go through that, that's it's not a great idea. So this is nice warm water fishing. You can see this is cold. I had just stepped out of the river and my waders and boots froze instantly. It was maybe eight or nine degrees that day. The day before we got 48 inches of snow. So we were hooking steelhead on caddis flies and buggers. And during that snowstorm, it was pheasant tail nymphs for me. The fish were still active, it was a tail water. And the anchor line froze. We almost missed our pull out that day. It was, uh, it was pretty rough. They're going to spawn in the spring, so if you're, I'm a fall angler. I'm guiding the shad run. I don't have time to go up and do the Great Lakes in the spring. I would love to. That's a pretty hot time of the year. You might get a little bit warmer weather than early, late winter. And then after they're done spawning, they're, they've done their thing, whether it's natural reproduction or not, depends on the conditions. Some fish in some bodies of water do naturally reproduce. Some just do it because it's what they're brain is triggering them to do. So after they spawn and they're done and circadian rhythms are telling them head back to the lakes, they go back and they'll grow for another year and then head back up once the uh, water gets cold again. Next slide. Alright, so what gear do you need? And here again you can see that riffly water I'm looking for, knee deep. <clears throat> and I've been fishing the spot for four days, I know there's fish in there. And it didn't matter I was that far out because I saw two fish maybe landed in six days. One of those was on bait. So what rods do you need? I'm a, a switch rod guy. I started off with nine foot eight weights, then I went to ten foot eight weights, and then the switch rods evolved. So now I use eleven and a half foot eight weight. I just want something that I can mend with and throw a longer line. The longer the rod just means the less work you have to do. A lot of people like seven weights for the Great Lakes trips. I'm just not a seven weight guy. Seven weights are sort of, I don't know, Ark from Tyson's loves them. I'm, I'm not a seven weight guy. Reel should be large arbor, something that you can crank a lot of line in if you need to because these fish are strong and they're going to probably, they're not headed upstream, they're headed back to the lake where they came. You don't need much backing. If you get more than 75, 80 yards off of your line, you're screwed as it is. So give it up, pop the fish off, and walk back upstream. A lot of these places, if they're crowded, you're not going to be able to chase the fish down that far anyway. So backing's good to fill up your reel, but you don't need 300 yards of Dacron or gel spun in there for steelhead out here. 
It's, it's more trouble than it's worth. And you don't want to lose a fly line over a fish. Now, I lost an entire fly line last year because it was a shooting head and the running line got caught between two rocks and it broke off and I saw my whole brand new shooting head float down there. It was quite upset. So your line, I have the word bright up there because in October, if you're up on some of the Great Lakes spots, Oak Orchard, Salmon River, it's about every 10 feet there's going to be an angler. So you want to be able to differentiate your line from theirs and then all of a sudden when someone's line starts slicing across the water, meaning there's a fish on, you have to be able to see that line at this angle slicing down, you have to be able to duck. And then it'll get tangled up in your line too, and it just helps. I like red chartreuse, I can see that in some pretty nasty weather. Weight forward, I like a dense head for roll casting. If I'm using a two-handed rod, my, uh, I'm going to use a Skagit Short by Rio or OPST Commando Head. One of those that's just fat and heavy. I like about a 500 plus grain on an eight weight. Something where I can just pop once and all that running line is just going to zip out between my... Always make, if you're shooting line, take your fingers like that and use that as the second guide on your rod, right above your cork. Your line will go through that and you can maintain it, it won't be flopping around. It's the thing I learned on day one working in the Keys, is when you shoot your line out, don't just let it go here, it's going to flop around. Shoot it and let it zip through your finger here, and it's going to go straight up through your guides and nice and evenly out. Uh, I like Skagit's, I'm not a Scandi guy. Scandi's more of like ballerina dancing, Skagit's more like Andre the Giant in the ring. It's just easier for me. I luckily was able to pick up a brand new one after I lost mine last year. So I bought a new Rio head the day after losing my OPST head. The cool thing about OPST is you can use them from three weights up. I've got them for my five weight for fishing the Shadron and for fishing stripers and grabbing the tidal base. It's pretty cool to have a Skagit head for a single-handed light rod. So your rod length should be about equal to your leader. There are regulations based on where you're fishing. There are certain laws and certain tributaries. It's odd that the fly angler has more regulations, being that we're kind of more ethical in what we do, than the spinning guys that kind of just go out and snag and litter. And there's two different crowds you see out there. And on the Salmon River in New York, we get two stretches that are fly fishing only. So we're sort of penalized for our technique. Whereas the spinning guys get, you know, I don't know, eight, nine miles of river that they can run up and down and trash and snag and leave all their illegal crap behind. I wish maybe we had a fly only section, you know, further down river. I have something up there called amnesia line. I use that a lot with my clients here too. It is. This is amnesia. It's just bright monofilament that has very little memory. And what I'll do is I will perfection loop that to the tip of my Skagit head, perfection loop it here, and then add my leader to that. And what I do is I watch this sort of, you can curl them up too, put them in the, the water, and you watch this as it goes downstream. And when it straightens out, set the hook. It's basically just a glorified strike indicator. I like to use this when we're shad fishing on sinking heads. Because when that comes up, my clients see the orange, and they know that's when it's time to roll cast off the rocks. And I've got this spool, spool's probably seven or eight years now. It was 328 feet or 100 meters. I still probably have 50 to 60 feet left with all the fishing I do. It's good stuff. You can also uh, use it to tie flies with. Singlebarb.com, these tie shad flies, just using this to wrap the body. It's got a bunch of uses. Then I'll do, so for my leader it'll be about two feet of that, now like three feet of 30 pound, three feet of 20 pound, and then a small barrel swivel, and then my tip it off the barrel swivel. That allows me to put split shot on, and it slides down off the 20 pound, it's going to stop in the swivel. It's not going to slide down and get my fly. And if I break off, you know, it'll break off the swivel maybe, and I know exactly when to tie my fly back on. Some states don't sell lead products, some schools have lead, so stock up in states where you can buy it. Same split shot. Uh, I like to use either Seaguar 
or Berkeley Vanish, about eight to 10 pound. If there's salmon still in the water, I might go up to 12. I really haven't found that fish are leader shy you know, in the nasty weather. I'll drop down to maybe 2x floral carbon, which is super thin. But that's only if I'm using a smaller fly. I still, like everything I use, even in Colorado, I still use Berkeley Vanish as tippet, and I fish fine out there. All right, next slide. That was the morning of the massive snowstorm. And after a couple of minutes, your shoulders and heads get completely covered. You can see the slush forming here. This was February of 2008. And we're catching fish. I don't know who that guy was, but we're hanging out. You know, you got to get out because your toes freeze. So definitely wear boots that are a little bit bigger so you have more air space with your toes. A lot of these guys up there have separate boots for up there versus, say, down here. Like I said, it's going to be some of the worst weather possible. I'm surprised people up there along the Great Lakes don't all have rickets, because every time I go there, it's cloudy, raining, and snowing. So I bring a lot of gloves, because every time you release a fish or fall away, your gloves get wet. And if it's really cold, they start freezing and smelling. So you just throw them on shore, grab another pair out of your bag, I might have four or five pairs of the same exact glove. So I don't have to worry about mismatching them when they come out of the water. If it's really windy, I'll have the glomits that fold over. Windstopper hat. I've now gone to like the Elmer Fudd style. You can get these at Marshalls. You look goofy, but you gotta have a good winter fishing hat. And this thing is absolutely bomb proof. I got a new one uh, that's got a little bit more of a bill on it. And then you can put these over a baseball hat and still get a little bit of shade coverage. Net gaiters are very key because the wind coming down those rivers is going to be cold. Spike boots, I wear the really big corker spikes on mine. Really big because safety first up there. I'm not too concerned that the fish can hear me scratching on the rocks. There's a lot of subsurface noise. Low polarized lenses, if it's really early in the morning, I'll start off with safety glasses from Home Depot. The ones you wear when mowing the lawn or weed whacking. My friend Smitty had a guy hook his eye. I don't know, before the, you can fish right before sunrise in New York, and the guy decided to go out and put a hook through his eye. There is a silver lining though. He went to Syracuse to the hospital, and they found out he had premature cataracts. So he never would have known that. The guy was uh, in his 40s. But still, I would not want to take a hook to the eye. And then I wear yellow, yellow polarized glasses the rest of the day. The rare days it's actually bright and sunny, I will wear amber lenses. Sunscreen, even if it's not sunny, the wind still will take a toll on you, you'll get wind burn. I use Dermatone, it's safe on fly line. They also make specific paste just for your face for skiing, so you don't get wind burn. And lip balm, and layers. You can always take layers off. It's better to get there with too much on than to get there with not enough. Then again, if your car is nearby, you can always run up swap stuff out. I will always start off with a lot of layers and sometimes you got to get there at 4 in the morning to find the spot. So you're sitting there at 4 in the morning, it's snowing, you're not moving, you're not fishing until about 7 a.m. So I will layer up. Split shot if you want to bottom bounce your flies, that's one option to go with. The other option is a sink tip. I've tried sink tips up there, I'm not very comfortable swinging with sink tips up there. I still prefer split shot. A net, if you can land a steelhead by yourself, go for it. A lot of the fish up there get snagged and will get broken off on and will have hooks all over them. And if you grab a fish that's got a hook in it and they jerk and it sticks in you, you're screwed. I've learned not to grab salmon. You'll see, you know, this time of year, glow balls swimming upriver. You don't see the salmon because they blend at the bottom, but you see all the glow balls and egg flies that are just stuck in their back and tails. They're basically just swimming fly boxes. The mesh glove is another good item if you're gonna do some gripping grins. Just mesh, it allows you to grip the caudal. You don't pull the tail there. The problem is it does wipe off some of the slime, but it helps you get a nice picture. Bring lots of flies. I've got more flies than I know what to do with up there. This is kind of an average maybe quarter of what I'll bring up there in a day. And then whatever I lose, I replenish at night, and whatever worked, I'll tie double those. 
And we're going to get to my preferred flies in a moment. Now you can pass these around if you want. Hopefully you're up on your tetanus, because there are hooks sticking out of those. I carry a big backpack with me too, or a gear bag, and I have Play-Doh boxes full of flies, and then I have what I call my working box, the one I stick in my waders. Go back to the picture of me in the river. All right, so notice how much crap I have inside my waders there. Two spools of tippet that are probably cigar, and one fly box and a bag of split shot, and probably like a beef summer sausage to snack on. And then if I lose all my flies, or I need to go take a break, that's when I'll go refill on shore. Go in. Next one, oh, a hook sharpener too. Always carry a hook sharpener with you. That's the second thing I learned in the Keys. The third thing was, nobody down there in the 90s used nippers. They all used their cigarettes to cut their line. All right, so how to catch them? They're just migratory rainbow trout that are bigger and are now eating whatever's in the river system. They're either eating it for food or they're biting it out of aggression. So you, if I like to fish, the left side bank, because I prefer to fight a fish this way than this way. I guess because my hand's on the reel this way. So I cast out, cross for me and let it swing down, maybe give it a couple little pops, and then let it swing up, and then if nothing, then I'll roll cast again. And that's pretty much it, it's a down and across swing. If you're going to be high sticking like uh, my podcast producer Jason, the guy must have some crazy blood pumps in his body because he can sit there all day with a 10 foot 8 weight and just high stick with his arm out of the water. I can't do that. I can do that maybe two or three times. My arm's going numb just demonstrating. So I like to throw out, keep my rod parallel to the water, get the bite, pop it, and get the bend on the fish. Bottom bouncing indicators. Uh, I'm not a big indicator guy for steelhead. So when the thingamabobber came out, that's when I really started seeing people using indicators up there. It's effective, it's just not my preferred method. You can find a lot of broken off thingamabobbers up there, which is always good. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a right angle leader. Have you ever heard of the right angle leader? Yeah? Nope. I've never heard of one either, so I'm hanging out, remember Larry Coburn? Yeah. Locals? All right. So I was hanging out at Larry Coburn's house up on a tributary of the Salmon River, and he was explaining this method, where I've got three feet of amnesia, and then I'm going to take a big indicator and tie a knot in it. I just do an improved clinch knot. And that'll take the place of the 30 pound on my leader. So, got this sticking out. Then I take my 20 pound, perfection loop it, hang it, over this and pull, loop to loop connection, and now your leader is floating like this, but the rest is floating straight down, like a 90 degree angle. So your fly is always going to get a perfect 90 degree drift off the right angle leader. And if my explanation didn't work, I made a YouTube video, I never heard of it, I've only seen maybe one other reference to it anywhere. I haven't caught any fish using it, I've tried it on car, steelhead, some other fish. Jerry Coburn also lives on the river. He's been fishing there for almost 40 years. He's got a little bit more secrets and techniques down. And then split shot. You want to be able to feel tick, 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 tick. Your rod and line will vibrate the entire way from your split shot up. And you've got to play with how many split shot you need, depending on water depth and speed and how much the fish are going to move in the water temperature. Swing down across, nib streamers, again, sink tip. All right, next slide. All right, so right now you got the salmon, as I mentioned. Salmon are swimming up, and they are just spewing eggs out everywhere. And these steelhead are swimming behind them. They are uh, holding next to the, the salmon, and they will even run into them broadside to make the females release their eggs. So if you see the salmon, and you see a female digging out a nest with her tail, Female tail is about that big, and she's still got plenty of energy, even though she's completely atrophied and dying. She's kicking up previous eggs from whatever fish spawned there earlier. Stoneflies, caddisflies, alger mites, crayfish, water beetles, worms. And these steelhead just sit right behind her in that chum slick and just eat. So if you find spawning salmon, there's probably a steelhead behind them. 
look for salmon building the reds. It's it's pretty cool. I've never been to Alaska. I don't know if or when I will be able to. So Salmon River is where I get to go to watch salmon active. And it's pretty cool to watch them. All of a sudden, the water will just just turn bright orange. The female releases her eggs. All the males fight her. So if you want to catch a male salmon, you throw it over her, and they're going to get pissed if you throw an egg sucking leech. They'll probably grab that. Maggots, once the salmon die, they're going to be, if they're exposed out of water, they're going to be covered in maggots. A wave comes over them, all those maggots float down. So you can just take little white S or a chenille and just burn it and tie it to a hook, and you've got a maggot. And then the salmon will die and rot, and chunks of flesh will float down, and that's how you get flesh flies. And then all that salmon biomass should be returned to the stream. So all that rocky salmon provides the nutrients for the next generation in the stream, and then the bears, raccoons, anything that eats the salmon, moves away from the stream and cracks, it's putting all that nitrogen back into the environment. So it's just recycling nutrients. Next slide. All right, how to catch them. So these are the flies I tied up for tonight. I tied up single eggs and egg clusters, worms, stoneflies, mayflies, did a tiny caddis, didn't bring any Helgenites or midges, buggers, intruders, and popsicles. It's what a salmon egg looks like when they squirt them out. They can be different colors based on if they get fertilized and live, or if they die immediately, or varying colors of stages of decay. These are the winter stoneflies you find up there. These are some mayflies I pulled out. And of course, you got winter midges. And when you're up there in the wintertime, those midges and stoneflies are all over the snow. All right, let's take a look at what we're going to match that hatch with. Next slide. So right now, match the hatch straight up egg patterns. So glow bugs. I prefer to use McFly foam for my eggs. It's just a tighter ball. It's easier to deal with. Sucker spawn tied with Angora yarn. It's Angora rabbit. If you've never seen an Angora rabbit, look it up online. They're pretty strange looking. And another thing, traditionally Angora, before they had hooks, you would just wrap chunks of Angora and swing it out there, and it would get caught up in their teeth, and you could bring them in like a gar fly today. This is a pretty bad representation of a blood stop. Some of these flies don't get good looking until my second day up there, and I've tied 40 of each. And then uh, scrambled eggs. And it's called a blood stop. It's named after Jeff Blood. I learned the name of that fly from Tyler Strait of Autumn Siren Flies. And then scrambled eggs, which is very similar to the sucker spawn. And these are all the ones that you're going to tie mostly with natural or yarn materials. Everything is going to be eating eggs. Fish love eggs. Colors, you can see, I mean, the pinks, peaches, whites, using either pink or chartreuse thread. All right, let's go to the next one. Let's look at synthetic eggs. The crystal meth, you may be hearing it under a different name. Some people don't like to refer it to as the amphetamine drug. That one usually has about three pieces of crystal flash hanging off the back. It's made with pearl diamond braid. Very easy to crank out. My best color is usually the yellowish orange. And then I take dog toy stuffing and I'll dub it into the front, and that kind of gives it this melty, fertilized, goopy, spooky look to it. And then a straight up Estaz egg. Three wraps of Estaz. Question. What are you using for hooks? Hooks, these are going to be, those are all on Saber brand hooks from Fly Shack. You can't beat the price, it's $6.99 for $100. Um, I stopped using the older version of the barbless ones up there, they would actually get bent. My smaller ones I use Mustad, and last time I checked, the ones I used were on sale at Chase Stockyard for 50% off. What's that? Tens? Tens. Tens and twelves, mostly for my smaller hooks. All right, next slide. Worms. You can see how dark, that's a morning shot of Dave. First time I met him, I realized that guy cannot handle beer. We had a little party after one of the greatest days of steelhead fishing ever. One of my best steelhead that day, we go on a little side here. We're downriver in what's now the upper part of the Douglas and Salmon Run. It's private water, pay to play. 
And I've got a huge steel head on him, fighting it for a couple of minutes. And I think Dave's getting ready to net it. He's got the net, and the fish is going right into the net, head first. And a snagger comes down. He's got his spinning rod, and he's walking downstream because he knows his fish is foul hook. And he wants to take it around the bend of the river and unhook it and take it home without anybody knowing it's legal. So he's like this and steps right on the tip and it pops it. And I'm a pretty chill guy, so I let it go, but people out there would throw fists or break a bottle over someone's head for that. You can see that thing's pretty well fed too. And that's a female, a hen. You can just tell by the smaller mouth. So the worms I use up there, Spike Easy, you can get that from Michael's Craft Store. Traditional San Juan worm, pearl braid, you either have to melt the tips on this or dip it in a UV epoxy and zap it, otherwise they come undone. And you can tell this is the mustad hook versus these, the smaller shank on top. That's called the son of the San Juan worm, it's just a single rubber leg tidal hook. It's a great little fly. And I've caught more fish on San Juan's up there. I've got no shame. I'm up there to catch fish. I'm not too concerned about usually what I catch them on. And San Juan worms work. And I carry 10 to 15 different colors of just the chenille up there. I will travel with an entire storage bin of just pine material. Right, next slide. Get some water out. All right, let's go to some of the traditional or not so traditional nymphs up there. Now, I see mayflies and stoneflies in the York streams. I have not found those in the Ohio streams. However, I did find this fly for the first time at Orvis in Cleveland. The Jumbo John, this is a bigger version of a copper john. Rubber legs, bigger shoulder. Put a hot bead on it, it looks like a stonefly with an egg. My go-to nymph is going to be a soft hackle flashback pheasant tail. And these are the ones I tie today after not tying them in a year. That one looks a little bit better. That's after tying like two dozen in one day. I was in my in-laws for an event, like a wedding, and everyone speaks Russian there. And I knew they would all ignore me, so I just brought my tying kit and just tied still, uh, steelhead flies for two days. And one day was nothing but pheasant tails. Hairs, your trout box has already got steelhead flies. Pheasant tails, hares ears, caddis emergers. You don't really have to change too much of what you already have. Next one, let's go to some streamers. Traditional bugger is great. Different colors, different sizes. That's what I caught my last fish on. We tied those buggers up at TPFR beer tie at Christmas. Just happened to have it in my bag, nothing else worked. Put one of those on, started swinging it, and came tight to a steelhead. The intruder style flies, these are tied on a metal shake or pin with a piece of wire and a hook. These hooks, I uh, forget who makes these. The thing is, you want to make sure when you buy these at a store or you tie them yourself, you're using stiff wire or stiff uh, braided line. You don't want that hook to swing down. If you're holding the fly and that hook swings down, it means when the fish bites it, you're going to hook them somewhere other than inside of their lip. And then Popsicle. Thomas Perkins, he should be here tonight. I don't know where he is. I think this is his chapter. He caught a bunch of steelhead on Popsicles a couple years ago. Fantastic fly from the Potomac. Catch huge bass on those, big stripers, and channel cats love them too. So if you're going to swing or nymph streamers, those are the ones to use. Next slide. All right, that's pretty much it. It's a short talk, I told you. Resources. Then I'll do the slideshow if we still have time. That rod is stuck to my tongue. That's how cold it was that day. I just wanted to see how cold it was. We were camping. It was five below when we woke up in our tent. That was, it was still fun, though. It was 32 when we went to bed. It was five below when we woke up. So if you've got uh, your phone out or you need me to send you any of these, Autumn Siren Flies is a fantastic resource for steelhead flies. Tyler will tie them and send them to you. He's got some stuff up there that I still never even heard of. Steelhead Alley Fly Tying, that's the Steelhead Alley guys, the Greg Senyo, Mike Dokito, that's I guess the group you're all going out with later. Tom's Naughty Eggs. So Tom is out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And he takes yarn and just ties knots in it, and then glues the knot, or wraps it and then glues it to a hook. It's the most perfect, simple looking, 
fly you've ever seen. OPST is Olympic Peninsula Skagit Tactics. If you want to start tying intruder flies, those are the videos you want to use, you want to buy their tools. They're the ones that invented the intruder pattern. They invented the Skagit head. Most of what I talked about tonight for swinging and flies is what I learned from them, which wasn't around online a couple years ago. A lot of what I had to do was self-taught and figuring out how to tie these flies. River Boss, again, is your website for water levels and temperatures. Check that so you don't drive to the stream and get screwed and have to drive home. The Jerry Darks podcast on April Vokey's podcast was fantastic. He also wrote the book, Fly Fishing the Inland Oceans. And then the shops, all seasons in New York, Melinda's, they've got some of the best fly tying selections you'll ever find. In fact, I call Melinda to get stuff because there are no fly shops in the DC area that carry really fly tying. Hoping one opens up in Arlington soon, but I just can't get what I need around here. Chagrin River Outfitters, I did an entire hour-long podcast with them last December. Really good fly shop, a lot of very unique flies. Most of them are tied locally by the Ohio Steelhead crew. Baldwin Bait and Tackle in Baldwin, Michigan is on the Pierre Marquette. On the other side of the river is Pierre Marquette River Lodge. And those are the only fly shops in the Great Lakes Steelhead Island that I've ever visited, but they've got everything you need to get outfitted for one of these trips. I think that's it. That was me last year after six days of being skunked. I got two two bites last year. Oh, really? <laughs> we do the slideshow, let's look at yeah. Let's see what a steel header does when you're on or off the water. Alright, I don't know who that dude is, but I took his picture and I think I emailed it to him. That's a nice big steelhead. Big fatty. He broke his rod on it too. You see the awkward angle of his leader? That's what a night of tying looks like when they're eating purple buggers. That guy had a Superman cape on while fishing. <laughs> These are what all season sells. I always take pictures of the shop flies. They're a lot bigger than what I would throw. Dead salmon. Uh, nasty weather. Ponchos, rain gear, head gear. Those are the eggs. Shore lunch, like I said. Very important. Hot food on shore. I was still fishing and caught that brown. I thought it was a king salmon. There, That's a specific egg hook made by Matsuo. That was the day they were eating orange. That was another. That was on a little pheasant tail. That's what a box looks like after a day. You got to dry them off if it rains or you fall in. I have no idea where that box is. That's tying on shore. I'll take a kid with me and just shove my regal into the mud. That's the pile of pheasant tails from the afternoon of my in-laws. We stay at the trestle pool up in New York. It's like thirty-five bucks a night. Can't beat that. That's the caddis fly that uh, Autumn Siren sells. Some more egg flies. Bins in one of the shops. You can see what colors work up there. Bright. <laughs> caddis emergers, little stone flies, eggs, midges, just random. That's my box. Like I said, I carry a big Plano box. I'll always take a picture of what my box looks like when I get there or when I leave. That's what a fish will do to your hook. Silica pack to keep them dry, that's from, I don't know, like beef jerky. There's a nice steelhead. Salmon eggs all over my boat. There's Scott after we missed the fish. The smell in that hole was disgusting from all the dead salmon. There's Scott with a nice steelhead. I had never cooked bacon until last year. I was so bored I decided to go cook bacon. One day they were eating chartreuse eggs, so at camp, a little midge last year. Like I said, I like the uh, crystal meth with the dog toy stuff in it. That was a salmon egg last year. You can see how they turn colors. That's why the guys that use the egg beads paint them all different colors. That's a white death. Tied by uh, Tyler Strait, chartreuse eggs I made. That's 
after a day of fishing, gotta eat pizza, beer. There we go. Gary Gullickson. <coughs> that year was fantastic. And the next day, it just built snow. Like, all day. Yeah, those kids are, he's driving now. I think he's like a junior in college or high school. Another one of Scott's fish. He's always going to catch the first, most, and biggest fish anywhere you take it. That was Rebecca's first steelhead. Or same one or another one, I don't know. That one took a blood stop. That one actually moved about two feet to eat that egg. And it was cold that day. I couldn't find where my egg fly was. I had no idea it was in my face. I think that might be it. Yeah. All right. Any questions? I guess, um, like, those browns, those big ones, is that, like, are the Great Lakes pretty much the only places in the U.S. where you're going to catch a big brown with that jaw? Pretty much, yeah. So, like, Great Lakes, like, Oak Orchard is known for them, Salmon River, places that have the, the power plants out of the Great Lakes where these fish can hang out in the winter and be warm and then swim up when they want. I've heard like the Milwaukee Harbor you can see in these. So if you fish Milwaukee Harbor, you're going to get big ones, but well, don't fish the rivers there. We're going to Milwaukee next year for uh, summer vacation. Yeah, those big browns are nice. And then if you want more browns, you go a little bit later in the year, more late November, and they're going to be way high up in the rivers. Like the Pure Marquette. Pure Marquette is the prettiest river I've ever seen. Good for canoeing, right? I don't. I just walked across it, and then I, I got one bite from a rainbow. I can't imagine steelhead and salmon going through that river being that deep. It's swimming pool clear. It was beautiful. I wish I had more time to float it. I decided to drive my boat up there. I got it fixed and drove back. The big browns are fun. There's nowhere within 50 miles here you catch a brown more than you. No, Pennsylvania. If you're real lucky, you know, like. If you ever read in the Ring of the Rise, Vince Marinero says after one day he stopped carrying regular trout nets and carried salmon net with him on Falling Springs because he lost a 30 something inch brown. Yeah, Latour. Well, it's Latour. It's a yeah. Big browns are nice. I haven't hooked a big one in years. We, 10, 15 years ago, still had brown trout all day long. I don't know if it's the weather, people say it's the lakes freezing and unfreezing differently, it's lack of snow, but I have noticed the fishery. But I, then again, I'm only up a couple of weeks a year. I'm a steelhead fisherman that lives in the wrong part of the country. Any other questions? So we were literally we five degrees weather, and I was spending a lot of time uh, knocking out the ice cream. So, what I do is the Raleigh fish has recoil guides on it, which bend. So, you can just snap them with your thumb and they snap off. Um, break them off with your fingers, rub my knuckles up the rod. You can put it under water and shake it, but as soon as you come out, the more you swing, the less that happens because you're not pulling line through the guides. You're just adding micro droplets of water to the guides. So if you're stripping in flies and then recasting, you're going to ice up faster than if you have the same amount of line out and just repeatedly swing it. So yeah, it's, they need to either figure out how to put a battery in a fighting butt with wires going up, <laughs> make the, all the guides out of copper. Um, I tried, I've done the, the pan spray, the Vaseline, a little nice off paste, and then once I used uh, Rain it. I don't know what that does for rock. I think it worked. You said if you can handle the bad weather, you get the rip yourself. I've got print pictures of my buddy Tom and I up there in 2003. We had the lower fly stretch for cells. I couldn't see you through the rain. It was that hard and. I don't know how many schools of tidbit we went through losing fish because we caught so many. The French guy, the guys from uh, Orvis in Montreal, Remy, he's the one that showed me how to make grilled cheese sandwiches. I usually eat ramen or uh, some kind of udon noodles that I get at an Asian grocery store. 
These guys showed up with brioche bread and like raclette cheese. Then they had cinnamon, raisin, walnut bread, and Nutella. I was like, I need to up, up my uh, short lunch. And all the flies that I used in the presentation are back there for raffle. They were tied this morning. I vacuumed myself off and uh, got all that mirror going. Thank you very much, Rob. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. Media.